Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Agree or Disagree, the podcast. My name is Kevin Olenek. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at KVOLE. Spreaker.com, KVOLE is where you can find the podcast. Facebook, Kevin Olenek, Agree or Disagree, the podcast. Subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. It, it could hear the moment Canada stopped everything they were doing with this. For a period of approximately four months between September and December of 2018, I experienced a consistent and sustained effort by many people within the government to seek to politically interfere in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion in my role as the Attorney General of Canada in an inappropriate effort to secure a deferred prosecution agreement with SNC-Lavalin. It goes on even more. These events involved 11 people, excluding myself and my political staff, from the Prime Minister's office, the Privy Council office, and the office of the Minister of Finance. Obviously, not everyone saw it the same way, including uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. It was important for Jody Wilson-Raybould to speak openly at the Justice Committee today, and I'm glad she had the chance to do so. I strongly maintain as I have from the beginning, that I and my staff always acted appropriately and professionally. I therefore completely disagree with the former Attorney General's characterization of events. It's been a four-hour testimony from Jody Wilson-Raybould yesterday accusing the federal liberals of inappropriately pressuring her on this SNC-Lavalin has turned Canada upside down. Pundits, social media... News, other commenters as questioned, analyzed, interpret, interpreted, and even politicized this event. Some, like Andrew Scheer, want Justin Trudeau to resign. Continue to govern this country now that Canadians know what he has done. And that is why I am calling on Mr. Trudeau to do the right thing and to resign. Some are also suggesting that this whole thing is not a big deal. Some are even questioning, as of this morning's debate, what is Jody Wilson's Rabel's ethics and questions, and why didn't she resign? What's next for Trudeau? What's next for the Liberals? What's next for SNC-Lavalin? What are the legal nuances that we're missing? And what's next for Jody wilson Rabel? Does she stay with the Liberals, or does she cross the floor to the Conservatives and or NDP? Joining me is someone who knows Jody wilson Rabel quite well and is a lawyer. Paul Doroshenko is an experienced Vancouver criminal lawyer who devotes his practice exclusively to criminal defense and drunk driving law. During his career as a Vancouver criminal lawyer, Doroshenko has handled a wide range of criminal matters from sexual assaults, white collar thefts, to impaired driving and shoplifting. He and his law office have successfully defended over 10,000 cases in British Columbia, Ontario, Alberta, the Northwest Territories, and Newfoundland. And he joins us today. How are you today? And a busy Not day. I'm, I'm doing fairly well. Nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you, too. Uh, you're a very popular guy right now. Well, just, uh, I think, mostly on Twitter. I, I wouldn't say that I know Jody Wilson very well. I mean, I, I dealt with her with two files that I had back when she was still a prosecutor here. Okay. Vancouver, and there's quite a bit I could glean, glean from that, um, and um, and we had a very interesting conversation one day that um, I think sort of set her off on her political mission. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, aside from that, I'm just watching like everybody else. Okay. Well, let's start there. What are you kind of? I guess start. What is your reaction based on what you know and your conversations and your from your legal chair? What are you seeing uh, here? Well, I mean, I, you've got to start with this whole concept of deferred prosecutions, which is a sort of a new thing in Canada, which apparently exists in other legal systems. You know, I'm not monitoring other legal systems. And this is not the type of thing that I would run across in any event. Uh, I don't defend large corporations when they're charged with criminal uh, offenses. But we have this concept of deferred prosecution where uh, if they meet certain requirements and they can sort of meet them after the fact, uh, they, the uh, corporation that is charged with a criminal offense can apply to be uh, to basically fulfill some other obligations, uh, maybe fire a few uh, corporate executives, uh, and then pay a fine rather than being prosecuted in the criminal courts. And, and that is sort of 
the new thing that that sets this all off because um, if you meet those requirements, and it's a pretty loose set of requirements really in the criminal code, uh, then any corporation can sort of do the what I call the official bribe rather than the unofficial bribe. The official bribe is bribing the government, paying them off, um, and, and at the same time also holding the knife to the government's throat saying, we're going to leave Canada if you, if you prosecute us. And this is really, you know, counter to a lot of our concepts of, of law in Canada, and it puts the justice minister in kind of an untenable position because she has to make a decision um, basically letting somebody bribe the government to get off the hook. And that's where it all starts. And, you know, if it starts with that, um, how can you say that the company, because it, this is designed for companies, lobbying the government and the government, you know, people within the government lobbying the justice minister are wrong under those circumstances. So I don't know that the sustained pressure that was put on her was wrong. It, we, you, you, would you say she was more caught in a rock in a hard place or was it just, just in your sense, par for the course? For a lack of law is incompatible with her role as mm. justice minister. I think the law is, you know, basically incompatible with our, the rest of our legal system that we've created this scheme where you can have, uh, essentially an official bribe. Uh, to get out of a, a criminal offense. So if we're going to create that legal scheme where we permit that, and it's, it's really like it's, it's wrong for so many other reasons. It just is, is um, you know, it doesn't have the deterrent effect of a criminal charge. We're basically saying that this is something that's acceptable. Uh, you know, if there's a legal scheme to accept bribes, then that's acceptable. Mm. Um, but the, uh, so I think that is a, a conflict that cannot be resolved because you know, her job is supposed to be uh, not political. Uh, those decisions are going to be inherently political. They're supposed to think about the best interest of the country, uh, you know, when they do it. Um, and so the, uh, the you know, the, if, whether or not the company's met all the requirements and then the best interest of the country. Um, so I, I think that, you know, pressure being put on her, which was the very first thing out of her mouth yesterday when she started, you know, gave her, her statement. Um, I don't think is necessarily wrong. What I would say is necessarily wrong is if she was moved out of that position um, as either punishment uh, or so they could they could do it, um, you know, get around uh, uh, her not exercising her discretion in the way that that she felt was appropriate. And if that's the case, if she was fired because of it, basically. Uh, then that's a different thing. And it hasn't really been answered. I mean, she couldn't say that she was fired because of it. She can only say, this is all the pressure that was put on me. Uh, this is, you know, positive indicator that this is something that they were doing. They were leaning toward firing me if I didn't do it, and they were going to replace me with somebody who would. Um, you know, she didn't get to that point because I don't think she could get to that point. And Justin Trudeau is, as denied that she was terminated because she didn't um, sort of succumb to the pressure. So we've got two people who are, you know, she's credible. She speaks, um, you know, explains her position fairly clearly. Um, and we have the unknown thing. Was she fired? Uh, you know, because she wouldn't um, exercise her discretion in a way that the government wanted her to exercise her discretion. And if that's the case, we have a bigger problem. But I don't know that that's something we can ever resolve because there's other good reasons that she could have been moved out of there, uh, including a bunch of things that uh, like Tyler Lee has written about an article in the Huffington Post basically laid out my opinion as well. I agree with her uh, that she could have been just as easily fired on the basis of failing to fulfill many of the things in her mandate. Um, she was given a mandate letter, I, I, you know, a whole lot of those things in the mandate later were never covered, like dealing with the uh, incarceration rate of, um, of First Nations people in this country. Um, and then she went beyond her mandate letter and went on her own, I believe, personal agenda on impaired driving law, which wasn't 
needing any fix and badly embarrassed the government when people found out that right now the offense is that you're over 80 milligrams two hours after driving, not when driving. Uh, you know, that was a scandalous thing that came out in January uh, in the, the mandatory arbitrary roadside breath testing was a scandalous thing that came out in January. These are both, uh, you know, good reasons for her to have been moved out of that ministerial portfolio. The, a lot of people are also bringing up the Colton Bushu, Bushi trial. Sorry if I mispronounced, I mispronounced his yeah. name. And what she said on that, do you, what are your thoughts of that? Could that, that have been an impact as well in your mind or? I, I, you know, I think that is, was absolutely cringeworthy. The comments she made, um, I think, uh, you know, commenting from her position is lots of people are, are going to criticize the justice system. Um, you know, if we don't criticize the justice system, we're in, with legitimate criticisms, then we're doing a disservice to our society. Um, the Attorney General, however, should not be, uh, in my, or the Justice Minister, should not be criticizing the justice system uh, in a case that's just before the court. Uh, and, and that, I think, was a terrible misstep on her part. Uh, I think it was uh, sort of an emotional, not well-considered response. Uh, but she certainly survived that. I don't think that was a reason that they would have fired her. Hmm. Uh, I, I think it was a. I think it was a uh, bad to be commenting on a case like that and criticizing the process on a case like that. You know, we we have our process in Canadian law, and um, you know, until it's gone to the Supreme Court of Canada, you can certainly discuss it, but you don't. You know, the 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 manner in which you criticize it has got to be has got to reflect your role in the justice system. Yeah, and and that's the it's 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 interesting here because now we're looking at a potential. The debate comes down, and I, I, I think to kind of bring this to some sort of like everyday you and I kind of conversation. How difficult is it to prove that you were fired unjustly? Like, yeah, well, that's the thing. In a big organization, if you think you're fired unjustly, half the time you end up, uh, you know, if it was a government office, you end up sent down to HR. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> you might get reinstated in your position. Um, how do you prove it? Uh, one thing that um, that Jody Wilson's got going for her there and that she, she talked about is that she made notes about everything and her staff made notes about everything. And that's, you know, fairly common with lawyers working in law offices um, to, to take notes about a lot of those things that they're worried are going to be contentious down the road. Uh, and then apparently Justin Trudeau takes no notes. Um, you tend to want to, uh, when you go to court, want to uh, look at contemporaneous notes that are made that uh, appear to be just factually based uh, to reflect sort of what happened and to be used to remind uh, oneself about what took place. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily uh accurate because we've got a, a point here that I think can only be answered by the minds of the individual who made the decision to shuffle her out. So how are you going to find out what is actually inside Justin Trudeau's head when he made that decision? Um, you can't. <laughs> so unless there's, a, unless there's a note about it, we better fire Jody because she's, uh, because she's not doing what we need on SNC-Lavalin. I mean, you may want to come to a robust common sense in, inference and say that uh, that she was fired for that reason, and a court might make a determination uh, like that, or, or uh, you know, even an auditor might make a determination like that after hearing all of the evidence. Hmm. Right now, well, as the evidence of her, um, the you know, statements that he's made as well, uh, he appears before the committee. I'm sure he's going to continue to uh, take that same position what he's doing. He's a, despite all of the criticisms of him, he is a smart guy. We've got intelligent people there. Uh, he's going to testify and, and may be just as credible as she is. We may never know. That's what's making this so fascinating is, is the mystery around it as like we, what we think we know and what we, we don't know. Um, but from an ethical point of view, it's it, you kind of you tweeted about it uh, uh, today a little bit as well or yesterday and, and it's getting more 
more play as, as the days go on. From an ethical point of view, the question is coming up, should Jody Wilson-Raybill, after she found that this, in her mind, whatever this was, uh, it was a breach of ethics, should she have resigned? Well, see, this is the thing. I don't think it was necessarily wrong for people, even within the government, to be lobbying her. Uh, that's the thing that she seems to think was wrong. Um, the issue there becomes, and, and it's a, it's a, something that we've seen with the Plekis report. You know, he's being criticized for um, not taking steps earlier if he had these concerns. Um, you know, you're looking at it and you're saying to yourself, do I have the evidentiary record here to be able to establish this? Well, maybe I don't yet. I know what's going on, but somebody else is going to come out and scrutinize it later on. So she's sitting there looking at it going, I know I'm being pressured. I know I'm going to be, you know, that this is uh, what's going on here. They're trying to, they're trying to force me to uh, to cut a deal for SNC Lavalin, uh, but I'm not yet, so I can't just quit. And, you know, she 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 resisted the the pressure, so you know, she she was in her role as she was. As you do to resist the pressure. I'll tell you, when I dealt with her as a prosecutor, um, in, you know, I was once she made, uh, in my experience, an impossible task to persuade her to do something else. Uh, it didn't mean that her first decision was necessarily correct, but it was the decision she came to and came to in good faith. So, the um, when they say that she was difficult, I would imagine they probably did find her difficult because you can. You can, uh, once she's informed herself well enough and made the decision, uh, I, I think it's very hard for her to change her mind. And she wasn't going to change her mind. Hmm. So should she have stepped down, said, I'm under pressure, and stepped down? I don't think so. Her job was to resist the pressure and to, if she felt that way and was exercising her discretion lawfully and, and properly, to continue to, to say, no, we're not, you know, we're prosecuting this company. We are prosecuting this company. That's what we're doing because it's the right thing to do. Hmm. Um, and uh, so I don't, I don't think she should have stepped in. I think that, that um, if she felt that the pressure was um, unlawful, then she would want to have collected as much information and evidence as possible over the you know, time that this took place to be able to defend herself down the road. And she did. So I'm not, I, take no, I take no issue with her, her timing of of um, releasing this information and and really when you think about it i mean it's it's scandalous and everything but the what she's doing as the former justice minister really actually enhances our our, our confidence in the process i mean it's we all know we all suspect um that there's um deals that are made that none of us would think are appropriate and we watch that and cynically think that it's politics but in the end here, what do we have? We have somebody who you know, spoke out about something that she felt was inappropriate, and she's had a, had a hearing, basically. Kind, yeah. of, kind of, that's what you would hope to happen in a democracy, I guess. Right, right. Uh, before we, we dig into Jody Wilson-Rabo's future, I want to ask you a little bit about how you feel Justin Trudeau has handled this. Um, he, he went yesterday... He did a little bit of a press conference, which we played a little bit of. He admitted during that that he did not hear all of the testimony before he commented. Um, is Trudeau looking bad here? And like um, playing this, I guess, from a PR point of view, and I guess from a legal ethic point of view, what are what are your thoughts on what the Liberal Party or Justin Trudeau is doing at this point? What's your perspective on that? back to the statements that he made when this first started coming out um, they looked like they were completely blindsided and ill prepared um, by the media and he stuck to a script and it made him look absolutely um, like he was trying and that was terrible I mean they were really blowing it yesterday when he came out um, I think he he was in a much better position, and I think they've sort of got their message down a little bit. When he said, you know, he he needed to see it, he said, I need to review it, review. 
So look at it again uh, before he gives any detailed response. But the fact that they, you know, and I, I think I'm sure they sat down and thought we can we can survive this politically. I'm sure they've come to that conclusion. And and regardless, you're going to fight because that's what you do. Um, but the um, when he came out and and gave his statement. Uh, I think it was all, you know, relatively well timed. The conservative leader gave a statement, NDP gave a statement, and, and he gave a statement. And he said, "Look, I I disagree with her characterization of this, um, but he still hasn't answered the question as to whether or not she was fired because of this, which I'm sure he will deny. Mm. Uh, but but he said, "Look, I have to review it uh, before I give a statement." Well, that's a heck of a lot better than. Uh, uh, Craig James and Gary Lenz, <laughs> you know, who spent weeks uh, providing, getting ready to provide a statement that is uh, almost farcical. Um, so uh, I, I think that was a, I think he struck the right tone there. And I think he actually, like, by the time you finished watching that, um, her, her testimony, uh, we've got all of these people saying, I believe every word you've said. I don't, you know, I think you can believe everything. I think it's kind of, uh, uh, paternalistic, um, and I found it really um, creepy. People saying that uh, I think you just assume that she is telling you the truth. You don't have to just say I believe every word you've said. Uh, but the point is that there's another side of the story that we found out very quickly afterward um, does exist, and the prime minister is telling us that there's another side of the story, and he gave us the uh, enough information for us to be able to say at that point, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, oh, let's. <laughs> Let's wait and see here before we, we take this any further. Mm. Of course, the opposition parties are just loving this because they actually, both of them now have a chance to gain some ground in the next election. Uh, the Conservatives actually think that they have a shot, um, and the NDP probably are starting to think that maybe they can hold the balance of power. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting, it's going to be an interesting <laughs> next yeah, it, it, few it, months. It, it, it is, but you know, it's it, what I'm finding kind of fascinating, and I'll, I'll get to um, what Jody was the future part here. I like to me when stuff like this happens, uh, like when it was the sponsorship scandal with the the liberals back in the '90s. There was sort of like you heard a little bit of an eye towards what? Whoa, what are the conservatives doing? Hmm, maybe they wouldn't be a bad option. Right now, I'm hearing more like, uh, I don't like the other guys either, and I don't know what to do. It's not like to me that they've that anyone has really gained any ground from this. Like, it's almost like the liberals have lost ground, but the other parties haven't gained ground, if that makes any sense. No, I, I mm -hmm. agree with you. I think, you know, part of the thing is the, um, I mean, the conservative Andrew Scheer is just basically an unpalatable leader. Uh, People will not vote for him, and they appear to have gone. Um, you know, they, they they no longer have are capable of keeping their uh, radical faction in check. Uh, and that was the one thing that uh, Stephen Harper managed to do was he managed to keep the radical faction from speaking up. They were there. They could, you know, they were they were certainly. Uh, I'm sure if you went to any of their parties, the the way they talked about uh, uh, their views was a lot different than. Um, uh, than they would say publicly, uh, but Harper was able to keep that uh, keep that in check. But now we've got Andrew Shearer appearing on stage with Faith Goldie, um, you know, who's a, a self-proclaimed uh, white supremacist uh, at this point. And uh, I, I think that people are looking at the conservatives and saying that's with this leader uh, and this, you know, um, ideology that they've adopted. Uh, more publicly now, that they are completely unpalatable and, and, you know, you can't vote for them. They also don't seem to have any, you know, the talent pool there is extremely uh, shallow. Uh, and I don't, <laughs> I don't think they're going very far. They've got a few smart people there, but it's, it's, they're not going very far. The NDP, uh, you know, are, uh, they have a leader, uh, but uh, for the longest time, he looked uh, indecisive. Uh, and uh, I think there's, um, again, a, an issue of the talent pool there, and a lot of people are that interested in, in, in voting NDP. I also think that there's a lot of racism in the country, mm -hmm. uh, and that a lot of people will, will not vote NDP because they don't have a, a white guy. Um, and I, you know, it's, 
sad and disturbing that that's the case. You could have a very qualified individual. Um, I don't know how qualified he is. I, I'm not really sold. Uh, but the uh, the reality, the liberals still look like the only ones who could manage. And I may be disappointed with much of what their failed promises, but you you generally speaking have to admit that they know how to manage because they've done it so long. Hmm. Um, and this is a, an interesting thing. If you think back to the Glenn Clark years, I don't know how well you remember them. Uh, the one thing that the, that, you know, the one thing they failed in miserably um, was stepping up to actually govern. They just remained ideologues, uh, you know, who were, were very critical and, um, and didn't really know how to govern. And most people look at the Christy Clark years here and it was a similar thing. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't govern. Christy Clark was great at criticizing, uh, not great at governing. And uh, one thing that John Horgan's worked very hard on here is, is making sure that they're actually running the government yep. and getting things done um, and doing it appropriately. And, and, you know, much to many people's surprise, um, you know, they have, they've been on that, you know, <laughs> they are dealing with that. They haven't been sidetracked by anything. They're really actually just focused on running the government. Uh, I think most people in in the country know that the, the liberals can run the government and keep it going, uh, and they don't look at these other parties as potentially um, able to do that. So, will it will it stop people from coming to the polls? Uh, you know, a scandal like this. Yeah, maybe. It really always depends on who gets the vote out, and getting the vote out on election day is just a, an incredible process, mm -hmm. and, and to identify every every last voter who might support them. Uh, and they know when they've gone to vote, and they just worked really hard to get the vote out. And I think it's going to depend on who gets the vote out. And a lot of people will hold their noses and vote liberal because the other options are just not there. So, which leads to sort of where Jody Wilson-Raybould goes. So, I was listening to her father last night on uh, Charles Adler, and he said a couple things that are rather rather interesting uh, about. First of all, he called the other leaders tweedly d tweedly dom. He's 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 not a fan. Uh, he also mentioned something. Also, kind of subtly mentioned the fact that she does not have the money to run for leadership, which I felt a little. I felt that was interesting because that was almost like. A sort of a politizing of a campaign idea that maybe she could, or if she gets the money, she can win the. She he felt, and maybe you know, maybe he's looking at things from a different lens than all of us are. That she could win the liberal leadership. Do, do you think that she crosses the floor? Do you think she has a chance of leadership? Like, what is the pol like? I I, I, I feel. I feel like there is some about my muse, my musing tweets about that. Yeah, so and I also I, said, I, said I also knows. I also think that she's sorry. I, I I also think that they're like the way that she's taking these notes and what she's done here. I do think that she is seen. It's hard to deny that. However, you look at this, that she has a political opportunity, and she is noticing. She has picked up on something that maybe we are all missing. Is the conservatives always hold themselves out as that um, law and order party, and that they're going to hold the line uh, on ethics, and um, the they often are exposed as hypocrites, um, but <laughs> and, and, and can, can be much worse. But that's the thing they always hold themselves out as. And a lot of the people who support their party do genuinely believe in that. Just because the the party you know fails them all the time by being hypocrites. Uh, doesn't mean that, uh, that that their supporters aren't looking for that. And she comes across, you know, this was also my experience with, as being law and order, you know, to the point of being incredible and, and, and not really open to new ideas. That is the type of thinking that you see in the Conservative Party. Now, also take a look at the legislation she, that she brought in. Um, the uh, the assisted uh, dying legislation is already facing constitutional challenges because they say it doesn't go far enough. Um, the um, cannabis legislation took years. It was like they had to 
dragged into it. There's no reason for it to take these this amount of time. It's been widely criticized as being extreme, uh, new new prohibition. Uh, you know, she hasn't done anything about Harper's mandatory minimums, uh, many of which were found unconstitutional, need to be revisited, widely criticized by the courts. Um, but, uh, you know, sort of a, one of his key things. And here, like, we're getting, we were getting to the end of the mandate with no change to that, no opportunity to introduce legislation to fix that. So really, like, if you want to forget Andrew Scheer for a moment, because I'm sure he's, you know, delighted by the possibility that maybe he's going to improve his his lot and has a, a fantasy dream that he's going to be prime minister. Um, forget that for a moment and just think about the grassroots in the conservative party. Uh, you know, they're looking at her as a, um, you know, they always like the conservatives, always like the strong man. They're looking at her as the, as the uh, strong person leader with uh, true experience governing who took a, you know, from their perspective, a moral ethical stand, um, you know, rather than being a, a wet noodle. And so from their perspective, from a lot of people who support the conservative party, they've got to be looking at her right now and saying, this is great. Now, the next problem that they have in the conservative party is they've got a long history of being labeled. And I think usually rightly so, depending on the individual in the party as either misogynist or racist. Well, how can you defeat that? label. You know, there's a great way to defeat it. Take a uh, uh, indigenous woman who is, uh, and make her your, your leader. You're not going to be criticized for being misogynist or racist after that. So they could really expand their, their, their grassroots support. They would obviously, you know, there would be some of the extremists might run off to uh, uh, Bernier's People's Party. Um, but they could probably expand their their support with her as the leader, and with her father floating that, um, you know, that she doesn't have the money. That's basically the same as let's start getting our organizational groups together um, to start uh, soliciting donations for this purpose. Yeah, and obviously it's not going to happen between now and the next uh, federal election. But when the conservatives lose in the next federal election, they're going to be looking for a new leader. And, and, you know, what role she takes, uh, whether or not she runs in the next election, I don't know. She may decide that she's not going to run and then uh, uh, run to be the leader of the uh, conservatives and then run in a by-election. Um, she could uh, she could decide to run somewhere. You know, she could cross the floor between now and then. Uh, and uh, it's getting to the end of her mandate. So. You know, it would be hard to criticize her at that point and hard to criticize her for doing so, uh, leaving the liberals, uh, you know, in this circumstance where she can say, look, look they left me. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, I still think that there's a floor crossing in the future, and I still think that she could end up the leader of the, the conservative party, um, but uh, persona non grata in the liberal party now. Mm. They, they, you know, they hold grudges. What about the NDP? What do you see there? Do you do you see her not a fit? Yeah, I, not a fit at all. Okay. And, uh, all of these people in the NDP would love to to have her because they uh, sort of a dream candidate for the NDP. But, but the reality is she's she is ideologically from you look at the legislation that she's passed, and you just have to come to the conclusion that she's ideologically not. Not a fit. Okay. Like they, 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 all of the legislation she's passed has been, um, you know, some of the, 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 the drunk driving legislation, for example, was um, widely mocked by the NDP. It had been introduced several times by private members over the years in the Conservative Party and w was laughed out of, of, uh, of Parliament each time, never got anywhere. Um, and then she typically introduced it, uh, you know, as a liberal, uh, for this thing from NDP ideology that, you know, the taking away rights in this manner. Uh, so <laughs> I just don't see any of it being remotely NDP. Um, I just don't think she's, she's aligned with that. She's, uh, um, she really is more, you know, lean, uh, just because she's, um, she's an uh, indigenous woman doesn't mean that she's a supporter of the NDP. That's, no, that's, that's certainly fair. Uh, 
So what are you expecting next? Like what, uh, what are you like from your perspective? What, like, what is your next question from where you're sitting here? Well, I, I mean, but what, what Trudeau says now, you know, I, I, yesterday was sort of at the same position as everybody else saying, uh, is this guy going to, is he going to fold his tent, um, and resign now with this? Uh, and then, you know, thinking about as you're listening to her evidence, you're sort of thinking about that. You're thinking about how many re resignations are there going to be uh, in the next 48 hours? Uh, so there's two sides of the story, and it really comes down to, like, the, the nub of the issue is whether or not she was fired because of this. This um, refusal to, to submit to the pressure that they were putting on her. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know that that's going to be resolved. So I think Trudeau's actually not in a bad position. Uh, she's in a great position um, sort of politically if she decides to, to jump ship. And if her goal is, if she's at, as ambitious as I think, uh, I think that's the direction that she's headed. Uh, I think she wants to be prime minister. I think her father's words decades ago to um, Pierre Trudeau were, were uh, prescient. And um, it will be to see where it goes. In the next little while, uh, obviously they have to prosecute them now. They have no choice. They have to prosecute SNC-Lavalin and politically. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this, the political interference in decisions that are prosecutorial like this, that we're seeing, you know, that we're, are, we have the concern with in the United States um, that uh, is being issued or um, all of that, um, you know, sort of undermines the um, undermines the, the the position that we've always held in this country. That is, that the the government is hands off and that these are are neutral decision makers. Um, and uh, it's concept, at least for me, of our society has been shaken by the election of Trump, the fact that he's not in jail, uh, you know, seeing political interference in, in prosecutorial decisions. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of everything you always suspected but could never prove. Mm -hmm. um, everybody with their tinfoil hats on. Uh, turns out, you know, a lot of the tinfoil hat people were correct. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly, we're, we're in an interesting time, but it's just was, yesterday was such a fascinating day with the Michael Cohen testimony, then Jody Wilson-Raybo, like it's, it's interesting to kind of hear where people are at politically and what, what that does overall, I think, for the well, belief. I mean, if, if, if people were cynical before, <laughs> they, they have a lot more reason to be cynical now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Paul, I want to thank you. Uh, I know that you're a very busy guy. Um, and I know that CBC is on their way as we are speaking, we're coming to visit you. So we will, we will end it there, but how, here and I think they're outside waiting for me now. Okay. So how, uh, just quickly, how do we follow you? Oh yeah. You can find me, uh, Paul Doroshenko at, uh, on Twitter. So at Paul, if you Google my name, uh, you'll, you'll get 15 million hits, but you'll find my office but my personal twitter account is at Paul all right sounds great and of course follow me kvole soundcloud speaker itunes spotify etc thanks for listening we've got a bunch of other stuff coming on soon and we will talk to you soon bye for now